Uh, we were just talking the moment or two ago, Spence, about obviously the uh, undisputed versus undisputed fight uh, that is coming up next week where uh, Canelo's going to be back in the ring. What do you make of him taking on a guy two weight divisions below him, the 154-pound Charlo? Yeah, well, listen, Charlo's a great fighter in his own right, and his own weight division, moving up to Canelo, moving up a couple of weight divisions, is always going to be a tough night. You know, I get what Canelo's doing, I get what he's looking for, he's looking for the big fights, and, you know, like you say, undisputed versus undisputed, it's got some appeal again around, surrounding it. But there is two weight divisions, they are two weight divisions apart. A lot of people feel that Canelo may have reached his peak, and he may be just starting to be on the downturn now, but... You would expect him to have too much at his weight division going into that fight. Carl, this is obviously your own weight division. What do you make of him, Canelo? Yeah, he's obviously a very good fighter, very talented. Um, he's been up at light heavyweight and um, he's, he's, done well, he's done well up there. But um, obviously, he's not as good up at light heavyweight as he has been down at um, super middleweight. So I just think at super middleweight, he's a real force to be reckoned with. He's, he's strong. He made easy work of Callum Smith, didn't he? And I know Callum Smith didn't look very motivated in that, and he was kind of happy to just stay safe. I was quite disappointed in the performance from Callum Smith, actually. That he could have done more. But up at light heavyweight, the Bivol loss shows you that he don't really belong up there, even though Bivol is not a massive light heavyweight. Um, but he, 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 he got, did you he got put, beat, didn't he? Did you put that down to size, or did you put that down to just sheer skill level of Bivol on that particular evening? I think it was a bit of both. He's very skillful, very fast hands, and I, I can remember watching Bivol fight um, probably six years ago in Monaco. Um, you might have been there that night with me, Spencer. I think, I think you um, I think you was in the casino, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but um, we was we was working for a, for a Sky show that night, and I can remember looking at Bivol and thinking, top amateur. And the way he dispatched his opponent, a kid from Australia, uh, his name slipped me, Johnson, I think his name was, um, if I remember rightly. But he just looked a class act, he looked dangerous, and I thought, you know what, he's one for the future. And when he stepped in with Canelo, that did not surprise me when he won. I, I didn't think, I didn't pick him to win, I thought it'd be a close fight, it'd be good. But the way in which he won. So anyway, back to Canelo, I think, at super middleweight, against Charlo, I just I get the feeling he's going to be too big and too strong for him and, and just too experienced and seasoned at that weight division. Super middleweight, for me, suits Canelo. Um, I think I'd have done him at super middle. I don't think he's big enough, but I think I'd have beat everyone, to be honest. That's what I did when I went in that ring. I went in with that mindset. Um, I think Charlo's going to struggle. How Stylistically, then, talk, talk me through how... Because you obviously come forward, all action. Is that what you do? You try to back him up? Well, we saw my fight against Arthur Abraham, and it wasn't come forward or actually. I, I boxed. No, it was slicker. Yeah, I boxed yeah, yeah. and moved and, and stay, did what I had to do to, and that's how I would have approached Canelo. So I think, I think with Charlo, if you can try and box and kind of old man Canelo Alvarez by outworking him and try and pick the points and just keep him frustrated, that's his only chance. I'm not sure he can take him on inside close distance in the pocket, as we say, close range. Yeah. Exchange blows and come off. First, but it's going to come off second best every time, I feel. That's the thing, Carl, isn't it? You know, with, with Canelo, you can't let him get into a rhythm. If he gets into a rhythm, he's very difficult to break. I think you've got to take that rhythm away from him. You've got to, you have got to sit in the pocket for him sometimes. You've got to punch when he punches. What Canelo's done is he's got older and he's moved up the weight divisions. He throws everything's a power punch. Everything from the jab to the cross to the hook to the body. But everything's thrown as a single as well. And I think the way that you will beat Canelo is punches in bunches, taking the play away from him, taking the pace away from him, trying to break the river. Well, that's what Bivol did, didn't he? He, out he outworked him, but he had the size to do that. I, I, do, I do worry for Charlo and think, is he big enough? Mm. But we'll, we'll find out. It's a, it's a good fight. It's quite, you know, it's one to... Yeah, technically, it's very, very good. And Andy, what do you make of where Canelo's currently at? I think he is best at super middleweight. I don't think it's advisable for him necessarily to go back up to light heavyweight. There was always going to be a weight division too far. And I don't want to see somebody lose just because they go in with somebody who's too big for them. And Bivol, he just boxed the perfect fight. And the way that Canelo had got used to boxing at super middleweight, he maybe got a little bit lazy in that he was bullying people. He would just bang on that shell until it broke and then he'd take you out. But he couldn't do that against Bivol. You know, he was, he was too big and he, and he was too strong. I'm curious to know, Carl, and you, Spence, as well, what do you think Charlo should do in terms of the weight, because obviously he's coming up from 154 to 168. Do you try and put on that 
lean muscle, which is quite a difficult thing to do? Or do you as a big super welterweight, which he is, probably about 12 stone on the night when he boxes at super welterweight, do you think to yourself, I'll keep that speed, I won't worry too much about putting on the, the muscle, I'll keep that mobility. OK, I won't really have to cut the knee weight, and on the night he will be a bit bigger than me. Which way round would you do it? I think I would put on the lean muscle mass. I think that he's got the frame to do that. I think that, you know, we're not talking about bulking up here. We're talking about lean muscle for explosiveness, for, you know, extra power. And I think Cole, that's where I would go with it. I think that because he is a big super welterweight, so he does have that frame. And I think that, you know, just putting on a little bit of muscle mass as opposed to fluid, it would be more beneficial. Yeah, I think he could try and go for the speed and skill and try and outbox him, but I just think Canelo won't have that, will he? Canelo at one stage is going to say, right, OK, you're outboxing me, you're out of range, and you, you're peppering with a jab and the combinations, but he'll close the gap and then just tear him apart if he's not big enough and strong enough to cope with it. So he's going to need that muscle mass, but he's going to have to draw on that speed and, and work rate from the 154 weight division and, and mix the two up. He how, needs to put the weight on them. How do you break the rhythm of Canelo? How do you break that? Do you know what I mean? Because once he slips into that pattern, that's what's difficult to break. How do you stop him getting into that in that into that fluid movement? I think when he's caught with with shots, the ones that don't see you don't see coming are the ones that hurt you. When he boxed Floyd Mayweather, I mean I know he was younger and a bit more naive, but he was still a very good fighter, but Mayweather was hitting with shots. And he, he just didn't have an answer for it. And he'd hit him with a shot, Mayweather. Then he'd get off to the side, hit him with two more shots. Then he'd throw that lead, lead right hand and sort of broke Canelo's heart. And Canelo, you could see him accepting defeat at some stage during that fight. And I don't like to see a fighter accept defeat, but I got that feeling when he was in with Bivol that he was thinking to himself, you know what, I'm in trouble here. I can't do anything about this. But I think against Charlo, it would be different because I don't think Charlo's big enough super middleweight and that's coming up two divisions it's going to be it's a real sticking point for me but i might be shocked because he is a very big he's a big guy yeah he? he is a big guy but like you say there if you go to the bibble fight and up like and light heavyweight bibble controlled the space he, he controlled the pace of the fight and the space he's more a importantly. fantastic talent that's he, why he kept it long and you know he was throwing the shots he sat in the pocket when he wanted to win it he took the play away from canelo and i think that's what charlo would have to do because you're right in what you say Cole, he has got a big frame, so I think he could grow into it quite easily. He must struggle to make a uh, down to down at 154. So at 168, he would definitely be comfortable because he'd walk around a lot more than that anyway. So it will be interesting to see if that extra size might actually be more beneficial for him moving up the weights. What about the pomp and ceremony of the actual occasion of fighting a Canelo? Because with all due respect to Charlo, 154. Well, I won't say he's had an easy road, he's had some good fights in there, but we're not talking superstar fights that he's had. This is as big as it's ever going to get for him, and it's going to be a crazy week next week. Ch yeah, Charlo's a class act now, and we're talking about champions here. Champions feed off that sort of stuff. You know, they go on to that next level. Cole would be better to speak about that more than anybody else. But, Cole, when you're at that sort of level and you get that sort of opportunity to go in against the world's best, that, that, that you feed off that, don't you? Yeah, you'd like, you like to think if you're a world-class operator, you rise to the occasion. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work for you if the guy's too good for you. Prime example would be when I, when I went in against Andre Ward, I went in thinking to myself, this is going to be a tough night. And I did. I made hard work of it, and I let him do what he wanted to do to get the win. But would I have been able to do anything about it? Probably not. If I fought him again, I'd have been a bit more rougher. I'd have learned from it. Would be in rough and being a bit dirty and getting my elbow in and leaning on him a bit and pushing his head down when he was ducking low. Would that have got me anywhere? Maybe, maybe not. Why, but why was your mindset like that going into that fight, though, knowing that he was one of the pound for pound best? But what I'm saying is, Cole, you've always been one of those fighters that fed off getting the opportunity against the world's best. So yeah. why that night did you, was you thinking like that? I think I was sulking a little bit. It was the end of the tournament. and We thought the final of the Super Six is going to sound stupid, but we thought that was going to be a massive occasion in somewhere like Las Vegas. Yeah. And we ended up in um, Atlantic City, yeah. which is which is actually Blackpool on steroids. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the old Las Vegas, um, but as soon as, sorry, the old, yeah, it is the it is, old Las yeah, Vegas. It, it used to be Vegas before Vegas got built. And then, right, yeah. We ended up, I ended up fighting there twice. So I fought Glenn Coffey Johnson there, and I was training for six weeks in Manhattan in New York. And then when I went back two months later in Manhattan, New York, flagging cab down to get to the Gleason's gym and Trinity gym uh, next to Ground Zero, I was bored and, and sulking, and it was coming up towards Christmas, December, and I was missing my kids. And I got in the ring that night and I just didn't really want to be there, which is ridiculous because it was the end of the tournament. 
It was for, for all the marbles, yeah. including the Rim Magazine belt. And I just had an off night, I had a bad night, but deep down I knew Andre Ward was hard work. I knew it was going to be tr tough and tricky. And I think Charlo's going to know that when he gets in with Canelo Alvarez. He's going to know he's in deep water. He might be a little bit dear in the headlights. I know he's experienced at world level, but this is a big chance for him. But it's down to the personality. He either rises to the occasion and puts in a career best performance and really goes for it. Or he goes into his shell a little bit and he don't fancy it, a little bit like I did with Andre Ward, which is ridiculous to me. That's the only time I've got in there and thought, this is a tough fight, this is. I watched him beat Kessler. I watched him beat everybody he's fought, and I thought, he's tricky, he's tough, he's hard work, and he's got it all in his favour. He's in America. He's got Steve Smojo who loves him, lets him hold, lets him do his work. And I was just sulking badly, and um, it, was, it was bad of me to do, and unprofessional. But I made up for it in my first fight back against Lucian Butte. Absolutely you did.